I would like to start with a film that someone has kindly made of um, some key words which form a kind of abstract for what I want to say in, in my remarks later on. And I think, uh, can I ask someone to make it roll now or do I just press enter? I am the author of my story. I need always to have my voice heard. Even though it is a light tap of the keys rather than a loud sounding voice from my mouth, it is powerful and full of meaning. When we cannot talk in one way or another, we lose our cool and get very angry or frustrated. I need to have my way to communicate or I will explode. To be seen and heard and believed to be intelligent adults and not disabled children makes a difference in how we see ourselves. I pick up on your attitudes and perceptions. If I am with people who convey they do not believe I have the ability to talk, then I lose my own confidence and prove their disbelief. You can look at how our lives have changed since we have been given a way to express our thoughts and words. We are people that experts said do not like to be touched and we allow our bodies and typing arms to be supported and stabilized. We are people that experts said have short attention spans to tasks but I stay in a conversation for two hours. We can listen closely to others and are more able to participate in what life has to offer. I am the author of my words. Never give up on finding a way to give someone without a voice a means to communicate. We have a lot of catching up to do since many of us have been effectively mute a large part of our lives. You need to listen and make sure you are hearing all the messages with both your eyes and ears. It is my decision because it is my life to live. I need to hear from others to make an informed decision but the end result is what I need and want. I make my decisions with the support of my friends and family. I need to have them to make sure I am heard correctly. I am the author of my life. I dream to be free. I dream to be me. My hope is to give others hope. I am a man who was behind the cement walls of a prison imposed by a system that could not see people's potential. If I can now talk to others like intelligent people do, then most any dream can come true. The author of these words is Andrew, a man in his mid-forties, whose severe movement and sensory disabilities prevent him from speaking with his voice. So he communicates by typing on computerized devices. And I could demonstrate or I could show individual people later um, an example of one of those that have text-to-speech output. Andrew's statement is a kind of abstract of what I hope to say today. He asserts he is the author of his own story with definite ideas about the meaning of his life. He also declares he is the author of his life eager to envision and lead it by making informed choices and in the process pioneering some social innovations. All his life Andrew has lived with the pain and anxiety involved in severe whole body autism combined since the age of 30 with seizure disorder. But his most difficult barriers have been the stereotype perceptions and attitudes of other people including those in authority. Andrew represents people who have been assumed to lack intelligence and empathy and thus seem not quite human like the rest of us and certainly incapable or unworthy of the same legal rights. He may seem more disabled than most, though he has been lucky to find reliable ways of expressing himself and showing that he can understand his situation and choices. Each person with a disability is unique, but Andrew's story can usefully illustrate the situations of others with severe disabilities, whether lifelong or acquired later in life, whose ability to make decisions may be doubted. This is a huge field of interest, which I can only probe in a few places, including the ones that I'm just about to start. Uh, I'll see whether Enter brings up. Right. These are the sections, thank you, of what I would like to say for the remainder of my talk. Um, 
We'll look first of all briefly at the human rights of persons with disabilities, barriers to communication access, what we learn from the story of facilitated communication, the case study of the self-advocates communication group, a case study of enabling the right to decide, winding up with how could we realize the decision-making rights of people with severe disabilities and incidentally make a better world. First, the rights, the human rights of persons with disabilities. Human rights in general have entered public discourse only in the last 70 years following World War II. But the human rights of people with disabilities have been recognized in principle even more recently, lagging behind the rights of other minorities. The Universal Declaration of Human Rights in 1948 did not mention disabilities, nor did the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms in 1982. In Canada, an amendment about disabilities was added in 1985. The great landmark declaration was the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, passed in 2006, which has now been signed and ratified by 158 countries, including Canada. The convention was at last a human rights-based approach to thinking about people who live with disabilities. It marked a shift from viewing persons with disabilities as objects of charity, medical treatment, social protection, towards seeing them as subjects with rights, capable of claiming those rights and making decisions for their lives based on free and informed consent as well as being active members of society. Article 1 of the Convention, 2006, acknowledges that persons with disabilities are hindered as much by various cultural and legal barriers as by their long-term physical, mental, intellectual, or sensory impairments. Article 12 declares that persons with disabilities have the same legal rights as others to express their free will and preferences and make decisions in all parts of their lives, including controlling their own finances. Article 12 recognizes that some people will need support, that governments should provide access to support for people to make decisions, and that nobody should be denied the right to decide just because they need help. It also allows that measures or safeguards should be put in place if there's any real concern that someone may influence, take advantage of, or abuse a person's right to make decisions. These declarations clearly state that people with disabilities have the human rights to make choices and thus to direct or lead their own lives. But in practice, in most jurisdictions, people with complex disabilities lack the legal authority. They and their nearest supporters may be unaware of their rights or unwilling to assert them. While we may speak up for self-determination in theory and want to respect the will and preferences of each person with a disability, we tend to err on the side of safety or protection. Parents seen by themselves and the community as always responsible for their adult children, may seem overprotective and controlling, offering few choices. Some advocates, on the other hand, may be so keen on choice and autonomy that they would remove all safeguards so that a vulnerable person might be open to exploitation. Our governing institutions have delayed recognition of the rights of decision-making by raising questions of legal capacity Denial of rights may be defended as protection from abuse and in the best interests of the person. But how much of our protective concern is really prejudice based on stereotypes of people who have or seem to have cognitive disabilities? People with disabilities continue to be isolated, excluded, and often vulnerable. Let's consider the rights of persons who cannot speak with their vocal cords to communicate reliably and make their own decisions. An estimated half million Canadians, about 1.5%, have communication difficulties not caused by hearing loss. They may have problems speaking, understanding what others are saying, reading or writing. 
A significant group of these, perhaps one third, have disordered movement and sensory systems that prevent them from speaking reliably or at all with their voices. They include people who live with severe autism or, autism or cerebral palsy. We can be more aware of Canadians with communication disabilities thanks to the fairly new organization Communication Disabilities Access Canada. This new organization undertakes social innovation projects to promote justice, increased quality of life, community access and participation for people with communication disabilities who use different ways to express their wishes and needs. Through its strategy called Communication Access Now, or CAN, this organization is focusing on increasing everyone's awareness of communication access to match other forms of access that are more familiar. We all know the wheelchair logo or the one to alert people to the needs of those with hearing disabilities. The new logo of this organization has a design which is sort of based on the pale blue wheelchair one um, and shows that communication involves two per people, two people is about interaction and giving as well as receiving information and includes listening and watching. This organization has worked with federal and provincial funding to build what they call ramps for communication in all sorts of community and business settings. If a child did not speak by age five, his prognosis was doom laden. He would be said to have a mental age of 18 months to three years for the rest of his life. Professionals might avoid giving an autism diagnosis to spare family feelings. And because the diagnosis did not necessarily lead to any definite or positive strategies. People with autism were clear candidates for institutionalization and probably formed a large proportion of those last to leave Ontario's facilities. While some interventions have been devised for children with ASD, autism spectrum disorder, a non-speaking adult with autism still lives with multiple barriers to communication access. First, he cannot use his voice to speak reliably. We now understand that this is because of movement and sensory disorders in his neuromuscular system that prevent his limbs and vocal organs of the mouth and throat from expressing what his mind may intend. Second, he suffers from the negative perceptions and attitudes of people around him. His muteness and frustrated behaviors are interpreted by professionals and the general public as lack of intelligence and lack of empathy. Mute or inarticulate commonly also means stupid, dumb in brain power as well as in vocal organs. To people best with full sets of nerves and muscles in good working order, it may seem that someone who cannot speak lacks language of any kind, let alone a sense of justice or conception of the good. When someone does not communicate in ways that are easily understood, others may stop listening and doubt the person's intelligence or even his humanity. The third barrier, he may learn to express himself reliably in some other way that he can physically manage and that is acceptable to people in control of his life if such an alternative is available and offered. A person unable to use his voice may put huge effort into learning and practicing an alternative system, only to find that nobody else is using that system, or that it is inadequate for open-ended messages, or that nobody can believe he is the author of his words. Myths, prejudices, and faulty assumptions still get in the way. What do we learn from the story of facilitated communication? which can also be known as supported typing more commonly today. All three barriers, as well as some bridges, are illustrated in the story of non-speaking adults with autism in the past 30 years or so. From the mid-1980s, a different approach was proposed, that the least dangerous assumption is to presume competence in someone who seems to lack cognitive abilities. This new idea began in the context of educational planning for accommodating all sorts of abilities in school systems. 
and this involved predicting each person's ultimate functioning as an adult. Instead of locking someone forever into a mental age of three, it would do less harm to presume and encourage abilities. The idea was inspired by some notable successes by individuals with severe sensory and movement disorders. Perhaps most um, memorably, Helen Keller, whose teacher, Annie Sullivan, assumed that Helen was intelligent, but just lacked a way to communicate. An influential breakthrough um, in Melbourne, Australia, in the late 1970s, revealed the cognitive and communication abilities of some severely disabled children with cerebral palsy, and eventually offered a way to communicate for non-speaking children and adults around the world. But the reactions of many professionals and organizations have continued to illustrate myths and misunderstandings. In work popularized in print and film, Rosemary Crossley, who had this breakthrough, drew out the abilities of a very severely disabled teenager to express her high intelligence and convince a high court judge that she wished to leave the institution where she had been confined since the age of six. This was a very um, special court ruling and a great triumph for people with disabilities. Crossley, a qualified communication professional, was not overawed by the fierce opposition that she met from professionals, administrators, and parents. She challenged their assumptions that children so obviously impaired must lack intelligence or any learning potential. The children's communication skills called into question the authorities' decisions about how they should be supported. People would say, of course, someone who looks so disabled must lack intelligence, must lack language, and should be just looked after humanely uh, for as long as they live. What Crossley called facilitated communication training, FCT, was observed and brought to North America in 1989 by um, Douglas Bicklin, who is Dean of Education at Syracuse University, who is still Dean of Education there. News of this approach spread quickly around the networks of professional and service organizations. Facilitated communication training, which became known as FC, though it is commonly now called supported typing, was observed to work for people with autism as well, who could not consistently make their bodies do what they wanted. With physical and emotional support from a facilitator, someone could stabilize his body control his movement and sensory distractions long enough to press letter keys on a keyboard or a letter board and spell out open-ended messages. And that's significant, these were open-ended messages. They weren't just yes or no in response to predetermined choices or just pointing to yes, pointing to no, pointing to a choice. They were open-ended that revealed people had language already, grammar even, amazingly. At first in the early 1990s, there was huge enthusiasm. FC, it was thought, might be the key to unlock expressive communication in children and adults who had not been able to speak reliably with their voices. The success of this mode was linked to new understanding that the core difficulties of autism, for example, are neurological rather than psychological. But perhaps FC was too easily accepted and quickly accepted as an easy response to what was seen as the most hopeless disorders. Such was the demand that some assistants were pressed into service as facilitators before they had time to learn all that they needed to ensure the reliability of what was communicated. Critical elements of technique, for example, included explaining to the person what is happening. Emotional support, believing that the person has something to say backward resistance against which the communicator presses, rather than any kind of guidance towards the letters, in fact, influencing movements in the opposite direction, so the person has to press with great determination to make sure that he presses the right key. Successful message passing of information not known to the facilitator. So in a little conversation, the facilitator would not know, would, would perhaps have a rapport with the person, but would not know facts about his life where his grandparents lived or something like that. So successful message passing would mean that facts and information not known to the facilitator could be communicated 
and this was part of the validation of the process. And then it was also necessary to verify messages that seemed surprising. If the person came out with something that didn't make sense in any way or was, uh, um, seemed to have some meaning but not meaning for that person's life, uh, it wouldn't be discounted. The person would simply be asked in, in some other ways with alternative questioning to rephrase or to restate what they were communicating. But the first wave of FC provoked controversy and backlash. Some professionals could not believe that people with autism could think or had language. Some organized small research projects to test the competence of communicators and claimed to show that the facilitator, perhaps unconsciously, was the real author of the message. The tests set up in these experiments have since been faulted for their research methods because the laboratory settings were unfamiliar and the test facilitators were new to the communicators and did not use the critical techniques. Negative results and reports of these experiments began to be published in 1993 and are still invoked the same studies 20 years later to condemn the, condemn the use of FC. Advocates of FC responded to the criticism with their own critiques of the research methods and with qualitative studies that were more sensitive to this mode of communication. There was debate over whether quantitative or controlled studies or qualitative or ethnographic methodologies are more appropriate for studies of human social interaction. A more sensational problem surfaced after some support workers interpreted literally statements that seemed to allege abuse by their caregivers. Several of such allegations were later proven to be true, but some were not. Caregivers and parents were naturally upset by police inquiries. Some went public and sued the agencies and institutions that had allowed FC to be used with their children or adult family members. Studies de denying the validity of communicator statements were quoted at that time far more often than stories of the success of FC. Notably in a PBS frontline show called Prisoners of Silence in October 1993. Threats of lawsuits against agencies, school boards, and communication professionals led to defensive reactions that made it very hard for autistic people who do not speak to get expert help with any form of communication. Agency administrators who had previously encouraged FC took fright and banned any such support. Professional associations of communication professionals did likewise. Research with a negative hypothesis has not been conducted since the mid-1990s. The same old studies continue to be cited by a few determined naysayers and skeptics. Most people do not give FC much thought these days and are not aware that what is now called supported typing can work very well for those who have persevered with what is their only reliable form of communication. Much of the opposition is based on misunderstandings of autism and how FC works. Some professionals, administrators, parents cannot shake their assumption that people with autism, especially those who cannot speak, are profoundly impaired in every way. Critics are mistaken in the myth that FC is easy, that's part of the misunderstanding too. Having never actually tried to support someone, they assume that a user lets a facilitator just move his typing hand over the board or device. But FC is demanding and hard for both the communicator and the facilitator. Rosemary Crossley, the founder, explains that it is difficult, limiting, time-consuming, and controversial. If you can find another satisfactory way for a person to generate utterances of age-appropriate length, then jump at it. FC is not a great way to communicate. However, if you can't make any other way work as well, then FC is better than nothing. Remember that what's really important is the right to communicate. Since the mid-1990s, several significant research projects using qualitative methods and techniques have shown that supported typing is valid in communicators passing information not known to their facilitators. There's a project at the University of Padua in Italy called the Easiest Project, funny acronym, but used textual analysis, analyzing 
the output of what communicators said and was all recorded and so on, to look at the frequency of the use of certain words, the length of sentences, vocabulary and so on, and found that the communicators had more sophisticated vocabulary and language than the facilitators in numerous studies and in, you know, in every case. They were, uh, they were accomplished communicators, they were already comfortable at doing it, but they demonstrated with new facilitators that it was really their language, their message. Some, um, so they have a richer vocabulary and um, are very unlikely to be influenced by their facilitators in what they say and how they say it. Some communicators have become independent typers. Some have developed parallel speech. That somehow the muscle work of using their hands and concentrating very much on language has actually loosened their vocal cords enough that they, after they have typed something that maybe speaks from the machine or parallel with it, they will actually say those words as well. That happens with some. Some have completed college and graduate degrees. A loose confederation of communicators using supported typing is connected with regular workshops and summer institutes held mostly in Syracuse. Books and films have been produced by individuals and groups. One award-winning film with the intriguing title Wretches and Jabberers about the world travels of two middle-aged men from Vermont to various supported typing events in Sri Lanka, Japan and Finland is going to be shown twice in the Greater Toronto area in the next few days. York University in their Price Cinema tomorrow evening at um, I think 4.30 and at the Hot Dock Cinema in downtown Toronto on Saturday morning at 9.30. Uh, if anyone's really interested in taking those in, I will give you more information. Some large disability organizations in the United States have taken up the cause of people with autism who do not speak. Some communication professionals now accept that supported typing works for some people with autism and agree that they should have access to alternative forms of communication support. Other observers ask why adults with autism and complex communication needs are required to prove themselves and perform at much higher standards than anyone else. One academic supporter of the rights of people without voices uses the term hate speech for the, quote, anti-FC rhetoric that oppresses FC users. In the face of studies that have validated the authorship of FC users, and given the number of FC users who now type independently, when it calls into question, without substantiation, their intelligence, character, or rights, thereby undermining their ability to express themselves, be understood, and be taken seriously continues, the political importance of FC as a communication tool is that it has allowed some people who were considered to be prof profoundly intellectually impaired due to their in inability to speak and to point accurately without support to demonstrate their intellectual competence. This raises important issues about the socially constructed nature of the concept of intelligence. I'd like to present a couple of case studies briefly about a self-advocates communication group. Where does this all leave com Canadians who learn to express themselves with supported typing? Little has changed since the mid-1990s. Communicators and their families have been on their own, helped by a very few dedicated facilitators who were not members of professional colleges. Though there is plenty of evidence that ST works, the fear of litigation, as well as deeply rooted negative assumptions of incompetence, prevent organizations like school boards and service agencies from allowing this form of communication. On the plus side, an exceptional group of communicators was formed more than 10 years ago by Andrew, whose words are quoted at the beginning of this lecture. The Bridges Over Barriers group meets regularly in Guelph and has connections all over Canada and beyond. It illustrates in microcosm the struggles and setbacks, abilities and potential of adults who cannot speak. Bridges members are lucky to have parents, friends and professional allies who realize the importance of communication in a person's sense of self and connections with the community. Accommodations are made. Environments and meeting formats are adapted to help people express their real meanings. 
people with complex movement and sensory disorders who have to tap out their words slowly letter by letter need everyone to be quiet, patient and supportive. Bridges over barriers are useful uh, communication strategies and best practices are shared. With donations from friends, Bridges sends members to the Syracuse Summer Institutes or pays expert facilitators to introduce new people to supported typing. Some have tried a technique of uh, talk therapy, really, called clean language, also known as symbolic modeling, that encourages people to use metaphors to address anxieties in their unconscious mind. The group is also experimenting with ways of getting together in virtual Bridges gatherings. Some of the people come from all over southern Ontario and parents are getting a bit older. So we've um, at present using a form of program called Click Meeting, maybe some of you know it, where up to 25 computers with people attached to them can be linked together. And we've been pioneering that with small groups of people, smaller numbers to start with. We can connect with people in the Sarnia area, we've demonstrated, and next week we'll be having a conversation with Antigonish, Nova Scotia. So um, this is all something to, to do all we can, given the lack of official support, to encourage this. As they show in their 2010 documentary and book, a documentary film and book in, in our own words, the Bridges members are not much concerned with the naysayers and skeptics. Much more important than showing they can type at all is to show that they can communicate messages of meaning about what makes life worth living. They learn from each other about their rights and the choices they may make to improve their lives, and thus they are self-advocates. Andrew, the founder, dreams of creating a Bridges Center of Communication and Life Planning and we do all we can to encourage him. Uh, there are a number of uh, items, a few, um, you're welcome if you're interested in them. There are some um, copies of this 2010 book and documentary v DVD um, up there on display, and if anyone's interested, you can follow up. Also, just overnight, we posted the DVD film on YouTube. So if you like to um, try pressing it, uh, trying searching for Bridges Over Barriers, then it might uh, be possible to find that. Another case study concerns enabling the right to decide. Andrew himself has asserted and proved his right to communicate. What about his right to make decisions about his own life? From the mid-1990s, he clearly wanted to lead his own life in his own home as a basis for many other good elements, including relationships with friends. We listened to him and helped him to realize his hopes. He amazed us in the year 2000 by calling for help, by an eloquent cry for help, in facing a future when he would be left alone without his parents, asking for some kind of safety net. He was well aware that he has no other family members in North America. After more discussion, we were able to create a legal entity of personal support, which goes by the generic name of AROHA, A-R-O-H-A, and in Andrew's case, incorporated in 2002, is called Friends of Andrew Bloomfield. In essence, this entity, legally incorporated, empowers Andrew with trusted friends who together take decisions that keep his good life going by sustaining all that's treasured and valued in the present so that he can be well supported into the future. His Aroha directors are core members of his circle of friends, his larger circle of friends. When preparing to incorporate Andrew's Aroha, we were mindful of his use of legal capacity, guardianship, substitute decision making. Like other parents, we worried about the best course to take when Andrew became an adult and we grew older. We knew that our becoming his formal legal guardian would keep him a child forever and still need another mechanism beyond our lives. We could not just leave everything to chance and have the Ontario Public Guardian and Trustee take over when Andrew was left alone. We disliked the idea of a bureaucratic test of his legal capacity. For one thing, whoever assessed him would almost certainly have prior negative assumptions based on his autism and lack of speech. We were influenced by the uh, great changemaker Al Itmansky, 
who in a book of 2000, in the year 2000, founder of planned lifetime networks, um, in a book called A Good Life for You and Your Relative with a Disability, made the case for both supported decision making and a committed support network. The Yukon was the only Canadian jurisdiction that then recognized supported decision making agreements in law, but Alberta and British Columbia now have equivalent kinds of agreements. Etmansky suggested that the one way to move the process along before it was legal in Ontario or other jurisdictions was for some pioneers in various places to groove pathways for others to follow. So we did that. Forming Andrew Zaroha gave him and committed friends legal powers to sustain his good life based on his wishes and priorities so that he can really be the author of his life. The functions of Aroha directors uh, more than are mentioned here, but include powers of attorney over decisions about health care, finances, personal care. We opted for Andrew's powers of informed decision making, supported by the other Aroha directors for most of the time when he is well. For times when he may be unwell, for example at the time of a seizure or if he has a, a very profound period of uh, anxiety and depression, there is what we call a Ulysses clause which is used in medical decision making as well. This means that in advance, when he is well, he asks his friends to behave or to act in particular ways in the times when he may be unable to express his wishes reliably. For example, during and after a major seizure or if he has some traumatic injury, he has asked, for example, to have certain kinds of support and not to have certain other kinds of support. The existence of his Aroha, as well as Andrew's communication abilities, make it clear to physicians, lawyers, and financial advisors in his life that he understands his situation sufficiently and that he has supporters who listen to him and have the legal powers to help him realize his hopes. The idea of an Aroha entity of trusted friends supporting a person to lead his own life has appealed to other people. Now there are good general signs of hope that alternatives to guardianship and substitute decision making may be officially encouraged. During the past 15 years in Ontario, families have become much more confident in speaking up for their members with disabilities and the resources that society should provide so that they can have decent or even good lives. The Individualized Funding Coalition for Ontario has had an important role in the past um, nearly 20 years advocating that people with developmental disabilities should be recognized and supported on the model pioneered with and for people with physical disabilities in the independent living centers. It has been a slow and frustrating process, but with some successes in recognizing that each person is an individual and should be recognized and supported to lead his or her own life. The Ontario government is even starting to fund independent facilitation and planning to help with this. Direct funding for each individual with a developmental disability is becoming an option to some extent. Yet in most of these, the person is still attached to a parent or to some alternate caregiver as a de facto guardian. A challenge by any other interested party could become a problem. An Aroha is a useful legal mechanism to help a person manage these new opportunities. Let me wind up with uh, a few remarks about my thoughts on what we can do to realize the decision-making rights of people with severe disabilities. Two recent initiatives in 2014 encourage reconsideration and reform so that laws and practices can be more sensitive to people with disabilities and, and empower them with the same human rights as other people. One is a major study by the Law Commission of Ontario the other is the result of Inclusion International's global campaign on the right to decide. Both accept as their starting point the de declarations of the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, that disability results from the interaction between persons with impairments and attitudinal and environmental barriers that hinder their full and effective participation in society on an equal basis with others. Reforms, they both agree that reforms are needed to promote the full equality of persons with disabilities, including their dignity, autonomy, and ability to participate in society. 
and to end the long history of discrimination, devaluation and exclusion and the worldview that accords them a lesser moral and legal status. While the Law Commission's focus, understandably, is on legal frameworks and imagining the difficulties and contingencies, it marks a remarkable shift from traditional Ontario assumptions about people with disabilities. It quotes an earlier Commission study that recommends that three levels of supported decision-making status be recognised in law. All these forms are based on consent and relationships of trust and intimacy. Any supporter must have significant personal knowledge of the individual in order to assist him in understanding the implications of his values and preferences. The focus in supported decision making is not on the presence or lack of particular mental attributes, but on the supports and accommodations that can be provided to help individuals exercise control over decisions that affect them. Legal responsibility for the decision remains with the supported individual who thus retains control over his decisions. The Inclusion International project is concerned, has been concerned with the situations and experiences of people and families in their communities in many parts of the world, or at least 80 countries are cited and have examples given. It comes out even more strongly for alternatives to current practices. Its report notes that people with presumed intellectual disabilities are usually denied opportunities to make decisions because of the preconceived myths and ideas and prejudices, and sometimes also their communication barriers, which was one of the few times that communication barriers was mentioned, and because their social networks are limited to family and perhaps service providers, and that can be a difficulty. The Inclusion International's report is entitled Independent but not alone, and concludes that reform of legislation alone, the approach of the Law Commission, will not change the informal ways in which people are denied the right to have control and voice in their own lives, or achieve the paradigm shift promised by the Convention on Human Rights. Also needed are personal relationships and networks, community acceptance and inclusion, and empowerment of self-advocates so that a person's right to decide in all areas of life is recognized and can be realized. We should not confuse the right to make key decisions with a concept of full autonomy that is completely independent and separate from everyone else. Almost everyone, with or without a disability, has some kind of support or collaboration in making decisions. We ask advice from experts in various fields and may trust their recommendations when we do not fully understand financial, legal, or um, uh, medical intricacies. We often discuss our choices with partners, spouses, or best friends. Andrew agrees with the idea of independent, but not alone. He and his Bridges friends talk about interdependence rather than lonely independence. His new book project has the working title Communication and relationships. He does say that it needs a catchier title than that. Um, and the draft introduction includes this. Now that it is known, or at least accepted by some, that autistics can communicate, I want to get down to what matters. What matters is that our quality of life depends upon good relationships. So supported decision making involves a network of trusted friends, who have, we hope, in the, as in the Aroha, legal powers to help realize the person's wishes. Sum up with my, summing up my response to this question, I have five ideas, two lines each. Encourage self-expression and choices in whatever mode of communication works most reliably for each person. Presume competence, listen, and pay attention. Find and cherish friends of various ages, personalities, abilities, and interests, in addition to family and paid support workers. Change the laws where necessary to recognize each person as fully human, with rights and powers to express will and preferences in whatever affects him or her. Work creatively on ways that people can be accepted, included, and supported by their communities. I'll just draw attention to another item that's out on display there. Um, 
partly because of the Bridges Group, a film was made, a dramatic film was made earlier this year um, called Holding in the Storm, and it illustrates how people in a community can start to be more understanding and more accepting of people who are different. And there are free copies of that little green booklet there, which has a little booklet and the DVD tucked in the back. So you're welcome to uh, take those if you're interested in following up. It on the whole illustrates this building community thing. And I would suggest finally, share and learn from good models that individuals and innovators may pioneer such as the Bridges Over Barriers group of self-advocates and the Aroha entities. Thank you. Um, I know at the beginning of your presentation you said that one of Andrew's most difficult, um, I guess, aspects to deal with are um, stereotypes in regard to people in positions mm. of authority. Yes. Um, and I was just wondering whether you find that Changing, especially from physicians, let's say. Um, yes. For people, I'm assuming, who don't have something like Andrew's um, a, a, a Roja? A Roja. Mm, yes. Um, I'm concerned that perhaps those individuals won't be able to make um, decisions regarding treatment. Or whatnot, right? I think that is still a difficulty, for sure. Um, Andrew is fortunate in so many ways. I mean, he's had some hard uh, challenges in his life, but he's fortunate. His doctor, who's younger than he is, actually visits him at home. Now, this is phenomenal, isn't it? And it's very fortunate. And his doctor believes um, what he communicates and, and reservations about this, he, he will listen to. He doesn't say, come on, take this, you know, jab anything at him. Um, that's very fortunate. I don't think it's very common. Um, He's younger, of course, that may be a good thing, that doctor is younger. Um, I think there are some other people who were so used and, and have pressured lives, you know, they have to see so many patients and so on, they haven't got time to be enlightened and um, um, to learn another way. And they may also belong to a generation that felt that sense of authority that, you know, everybody should take, for example, what the doctor said. Um, unfortunately, it's probably still true in, uh, it's partly an age thing, but it isn't just that. But sometimes we've certainly noticed that some professionals who built their reputations on writing about people with autism, for example, way back in the 1960s and 70s, and even a little later, don't want to change. You know, they've published on this subject, they're known to have done it. So yes, that is a problem. Um, we hope that we're making a little bit of a difference now, and certainly the change in the Ontario government, just a little bit, um, is, is something that is very welcome, that at least there's some openness to thinking that there can be other ways. It isn't just through the traditional service agencies that people should be served. So let's hope that's the case. On the other hand, um, some of what I do in my voluntary capacity is to um, respond to people telling horror stories really of what the, how they've been treated and it's still the case that people even those who communicate with um, with supported typing and have been demonstrated they're in the films and all that um, are denied any voice in their own care so it's it's still difficult um, there are prejudices and assumptions that still get in the way. And, and you can understand it to some extent, but you have to approach one person at a time probably and see um, how much that person is understanding. You know, everybody says, of course everybody knows people with autism haven't got any intelligence. Just look at them, you know, they don't, they don't give eye contact. All that sort of thing is something you have to get over. So maybe if uh, some of you may be interested in looking at that film that I mentioned, the one about holding in the storm, um, it's, a f um, it, it's a rather nice little film. It, it's dramatic rather than a documentary, but it's, uh, it does sort of get, just starts nibbling away at that. And it did have um, some people who are close to us and who've done documentary films might have thought, well, you know, does it say very much? You know, this should be, it should say more than that. But I think it, it actually speaks to um, people who don't yet know a lot and, and it kind of encourages them to, to start thinking differently, perhaps. It's certainly in our neighborhood, for example, we had various neighbors who came to see the launch of the film in Guelph in, 
in, our, in March in Andrew's neighborhood. And uh, it just gradually, just gradually helps people's attitudes to change. And so Andrew is greeted, for example, when he walks around the neighborhood. But he's been, it, it takes a little while for all that to happen. But with, um, with some of the law reform of Ontario thing happening, that will, we need attitudes and we need law, <laughs> uh, both. Yes. Hey, I just had a question about um, whether you had any experience with cases where the person with a disability expressed a, a desire or um, a decision that the people in the support group thought wasn't in that person's best interest. So that there was that yes. kind of disagreement. I'm just curious what kind of conversation results or mm -hmm. what, like what happens then and how that conversation if the people in the support group are truly open to listening and believing and presuming competence, I don't think it's going to arise. We do know some cases where people who have been part of the Bridges group, but then, uh, for example, just a hypothetical example, a parent, parents are getting older and they decide they can no longer support their person themselves and they think well you know I must do something quickly and there's a vacancy in some kind of tr more traditional kind of living arrangement then they may make a decision without really having the discussion they may the only way in which they may do it they may sort of tell the person it's going to happen and you'd better uh, make the best of it and you can talk about it if you like but um, it's going to happen anyway so in that case, there wasn't actually a legal framework uh, around them. Um, in the constitution of the AROHA entity, the legal entity, then uh, there is provision for this in a way in that um, sometimes, of course, decisions have to be made quickly. But usually there's time for preparing for all this. And there is provision for there to be consensual decision making rather than anybody ramming anything through. And of course, um, in our case, anyway, we're lucky to have had an Aroha all these years. Two of the directors are in this room, in fact. Um, so uh, we're very, very fortunate that we have, um, we have people who have been around for that length of time, who respect Andrew and so on. Um, they would listen to him, and he would listen to them. He would say, um, what do you think about this idea? This is what I like. Uh, one example is that he, it really turns out that he dislikes change that is really sudden and surprising. He needs to be prepared for it. And of course, this method and clean language and all that do compare, prepare him very well for this. But what he, we used to think in the past that he disliked change of any kind. But with preparation for it, he can accommodate change. It's just the sudden thing. Suddenly something happens. So he knows that I'm here today. But I had to write quite a long social story and explain I was going and of course that his words were being used and he's very happy about that. But uh, if I had just disappeared, it would be a little, could be a little puzzling for him, especially if I left him some, someone other than his father. So um, that's, that's fortunate, but the, um, um, the difficulty is that sometimes people, um, I, I lost my train of thought there, I'm awfully sorry. Um, just re restate the question that you'd like to ask me to answer still. <laughs> yes, yes. How the conversation goes. Yes. Yes. Right. I was partly thinking of the way those conversations go when you have a person who doesn't have a disability. Mm -hmm. And often those. Those conversations yes. can be very contentious when someone you care about yes. wants to do something and you think is bad for them. So I didn't know if the... Andrew, says, Andrew says it's fortunate that he doesn't talk. He has to think before he says all this. <laughs> and and, it, and it, he was also canvassing for the mayor last week, the mayor of Guelph, that is, in that case, by sending le taking leaflets around to all the houses. And one of the rules is he's very politically aware and, and a very good citizen. This is just by the way. But he, uh, I was telling someone else, I think, uh, that um, when we deliver to the mailboxes, which he's very good at, um, you're not supposed to engage in conversation or just say good day or whatever. You're not supposed to start talking up the mayor or anything. And Andrew said, I'm an ideal person. I'm perfect at that job because I can't talk. 
So, uh, so that does help in the meetings, doesn't it? And he is respectful. And um, I suppose the other thing that I haven't really explained in this prototyping, the way Andrew does it, which we think is very productive, is that he doesn't just have a conversation with his facilitator. Instead, it's, um, there are what we might call uh, discussants. And uh, if there's a typical piece of furniture, he's here, his facilitator is here, and he's typing on his device. And then there are two or three, one or however many people facing him. And so they ask questions or listen to him, of course, but then say, I was interested, could you just clarify that a little bit more? And that's very helpful. So it isn't easy, it isn't quick. But I suppose by the time you have a good relationship, you can actually speed it up a bit more. And of course, he can respond if he gets questions from other friends as well as members of his Aroha. He can um, answer by email. So um, it isn't something that you can just do quickly. Right, answer all these questions. There was the Law Reform of Ontario had a, uh, the Law Reform Commission rather, had a, had a questionnaire for people who might support decision making and people who are supported in decision making. And Andrew answered all that. You know, he, uh, he answered it extremely lucidly, all in one spell. I think he might have seen the questions first on an earlier occasion and perhaps even copy typed them so that he was prepared for it. But I think the idea of having a discussion, and that does get over the idea of um, people, people's conversation not being valid if they're having a conversation only with the facilitator who's actually supporting their arm or something like that, then um, anyone else watching might think, well, how do we know? When the discussion is general with discussants, then the facilitator doesn't know anything about um, what it is. And Andrew, uh, Andrew also composes poetry. He carries it around in his head, and then when he has an opportunity and feels the spirit moves him, he'll do a whole poem. He composes poetry with both his main facilitators. And the, uh, the language and the rhythm and so on of the poetry is similar. It's him, it's not them. And they don't know each other. So um, we know all sorts of things like that. But we have to consider that possibility that, uh, and the facilitators do themselves sometimes say to him, you know, I was thinking what you just said. Did you know I was thinking that? So it would be, um, uh, they, they do, they're conscious of the, the risk of perhaps influencing people by ESP even. So, um, but back to the question more in terms of decision making, then I think it has to be part of a discussion and there has to be give and take and listening and, and in Andrew's case, he would want to listen. That's, that's a really important thing. He did a, a good, he's dying to do more courses. If anyone knows good online courses in his fields, he did an online course put out by the Communication uh, Disabilities Access Canada to become a communication mentor. He did it superbly well. We'd, he'd never encountered multiple choice questions before. He did them well too. Then he got a certificate. But one of the things we all learned from it was that to be a good communication mentor, you don't draw people. Here I am telling you. Uh, you don't sort of tell people what all the time. You listen and you, you find, you say, have you considered something or other, something or other, something or other? And, and then that he, he picked up on that very well, and we all learned from it as well. So that's something that is very true here, not just laying down the law and saying, these are your choices. You could have an apartment or a house or a boarding house or something like that. But what would the kind of place that you feel happiest in, what would it feel like? And building on that. <laughs> I wonder, first of all, for each of those sentences that we read and heard in the video, approximately how long does it take for Andrew to compose a sentence like that? I'm wondering how, you know, how much time is occupied by communication. Relatedly, I'm wondering um, how many hours a day on average Andrew has access to someone who can um, facilitate his communication. And then thinking about those sorts of temporal um, limits, I'm wondering how 
the presence of those sorts of limits affects his interlocutor's interactions with him. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, if I can remember the question, how much, how long would it take him to make that statement? Um, this is sort of a page, a uh, little less than a page altogether. Um, he actually composed most of that in one go, and then there's a piece of it that's taken, the bit about the cement walls of a prison and all that is taken from his autobiography of a few years ago, it just seemed to follow on there. So we edited it in there. Um, he seems to carry it around in his head. Now he's quite fast. He's faster than, uh, if you liked, the DVD of the Bridges um, group in 2010 has views of people typing in a big room, everybody um, doing their typing. He's really quite fast at it, uh, if he's well. And so he would have, uh, I should really put it another way, um, since he didn't do that all in one piece, I actually can do a word count. We record everything he types, well, virtually everything, except if it's, you know, I want a bath now or something like that. Um, but when he has a major conversation, we record it because he uses the laptop and a write out loud software, so he both um, feels it and hears the words coming back. He's always said he must have a voice on his machine. So we record it, and I know that um, he would quite routinely compose about 1,500 words in a two hour period. So, and this is words of meaning. You know, it, it makes sense. Uh, sometimes because of the awkwardness of um, the keyboard and the key guards and so forth, he might make a little error or leave out a letter or a letter may not register sometimes if he doesn't type hard enough. So sometimes one needs to edit some of that. He does have a lot of practice that makes him more dexterous with typing because he also copy types. <coughs> Um, he learned to do this ooh, about 15 more years ago, and it has given him a, a way of learning. Um, he, when I was composing this lecture, for example, it kept disappearing from my desk, and he would, uh, he would type, type out these things, and I would have to go and retrieve the pages, and, and all sorts of other things as well. I mean, uh, financial statements and um, uh, board meeting minutes and things like that. He, he just has a, a hunger for, for material. So he, but he also has more interesting stuff than that. Um, he will uh, do a lot of that, which probably increases his dexterity. So as to how often he has people come, um, so he would spend, a day wouldn't be a good day if he didn't have some copy typing in it. So he, he can do this by himself with his service dog at his feet. And he can do this for two or three hours very happily. And you know, someone else is in the house, but it's part of a quite busy um, range of activities, but he likes to do that. It's kind of, kind of reassuring. When he knows a document very thoroughly, he will ring the changes by what he calls meandering. And this will mean taking a phrase out of one page here and there, and a phrase out of, more or less like skimming a book, I suppose. But, uh, so he does have a lot of practice with, with typing and with words. He has, um, most weeks, he will have a visit by some expert facilitator for a, between one and a half and two and a half hours two different people come. And then as well, someone who's also his mentor with plants and nature and gardening and so forth, has also become, and she's also the clean language person, has also become keen to develop expertise with this. And she's sort of modest about it yet, but he actually opens up very well with her. So he would have, um, and he will also type a bit with me at times, but, um, I prefer not to be the main person, uh, though some mothers are in some people's lives, because I'm so involved in his life that I, I would certainly worry about um, his reading my mind or uh, having the same vocabulary or something like that. So I don't doubt his ability, but I prefer to be a discussant, for example, on the other side of the table.